for a deal to be done. Let's get the executive back up and running. Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I am pleased to inform the House that since last week we have been providing British Sign Language coverage on all question statements as a matter of course. This is available directly on ParliamentLive.tv and is also available to broadcasters, media outlets who may be interested in taking up the live feed. I am delighted that House Service has been able to deliver this significant improvement to accessibility of our proceedings. We now start with questions, Prime Minister. Jason McCartney. Question one, please, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House. I shall have further such meetings later today. Jason McCartney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. According to the Alzheimer's Society, nearly 5,000 people are currently living with dementia in my Colm Valley constituency, of whom 3,153 have had a formal diagnosis. That figure went up by one this week with my dad's diagnosis. My dad is my constituent. Will my right honourable friend pledge to make dementia a priority by driving up diagnosis rates, bolstering dementia research, investing in social care and improving access to the most innovative diagnostic methods and improving access to new life-changing treatments? Prime Minister. Well, can I send my warmest wishes to my honourable friend and his father and family, and I recognise that a dementia diagnosis can bring worry, both for the person uh, who is diagnosed but also their wider family. And my honourable friend is absolutely right about the timely diagnosis of dementia. It's vital to make sure that those affected can access the care and support they need. NHS England is actually carrying out a pilot to make sure that we can improve dementia diagnosis in care homes. Our major condition strategy also includes a focus on dementia, but crucially, as my honourable friend said, we are now doubling the funding for dementia research so we can help everyone, including his father. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, can I send my best wishes to the Honourable Member and his father also and all those suffering in this way? Mr Speaker, I can't let today pass without saying how saddened I was by the tragic death of Bronson Battersby, aged just two, who died in heartbreaking circumstances in Skegness. I know that this House will join me in sending our deepest sympathies to his family. Mr Speaker, the Government has been forced to admit that it has lost contact with 85 per cent of the 5,000 people earmarked for removal to Rwanda. Has he found them yet? Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, what I can tell the Honourable Gentleman is that in spite of him blocking every, in spite of him blocking every single attempt that we have taken, we have managed now, because of our actions, to reduce the number of people coming here by over a third last year, remove over 20,000 people from this country back to their home countries, carried out 70% more illegal enforcement raids, arrested hundreds of people, closed down thousands of bank accounts, and processed over 100,000 cases, the biggest number in over 20 years, Mr Speaker. That's because on this side of the House, we want to stop the boats. We have a plan. It's working. And with him, we would just go back to square one. Mr. My my first thought is, how do you actually lose 4,250 people? Uh, Then you remember that this is the government that scrapped HS2, but the costs are still rising by billions. This is the government that spent £400 million of taxpayers' money on a Rwanda scheme yet can't deport a single person. And this is the government that waged a week-long war on the Greek Prime Minister for reasons known only to themselves. And suddenly you're reminded that, of course, this farce of a government could lose the people it was planning to remove. But he didn't answer the question, so I'll ask him again. Where are the 4,250 people that the government has lost? Where are they? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, as I said, we've actually identified and removed over 20,000 people from this country back to where they belong. But, but he talks, he asks these questions about the Rwanda scheme, Mr Speaker. Now, it is important. 
that we get this up and running, because it's important, as the National Crime Agency say, that we have a working deterrence to resolve this issue. That's indeed how Australia solved this problem, and that's how Albania has worked for us. But we know he asked these questions, Mr Speaker, about the detail of these things, but we all know he doesn't, he doesn't actually care about solving this problem, and we know this, because when, when the BBC asked him, when the BBC asked him about the Rwanda plan, they quizzed him, they said, if the numbers crossing the channel on small boats decline, i.e. so it's working, would you still reverse it? The Labour leader said yes. It's crystal clear he doesn't have a plan and it will be back to square one. Mr Mr. Speaker, spending £400 million on a plan not to get anybody to Rwanda whilst losing 4,000 people is not a plan. It's a farce. Uh, uh, only, this, only this government could waste hundreds of millions of pounds on a removals policy that doesn't remove anyone. <laughs> o- only this government could claim that it's going to get flights off the ground only to discover they couldn't find a plane. <laughs> only th- only this government could sign a removal deal with Rwanda, only to end up taking people from Rwanda to here. <laughs> but, it, but he still hasn't answered the question. So I'll try again. What progress has he made in locating the 4,250 people his government has apparently lost? He's dodged it three times. Where are they? <laughs> Mr Speaker, it's... The same thing again and again. Here we are talking about what we are doing. But I'm happy, I'm happy to go over it, Mr Speaker. What are we doing? We've increased the number of illegal enforcement raids by 70%, leading to thousands of arrests, using powers, Mr Speaker, that he blocked in this House. We have closed down thousands of bank accounts of illegal workers, again, using powers that he blocked, Mr Speaker. Or, 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 Mr. Trump. Do you want that early cup of tea, or are you going to be a little bit more silent, Prime Minister? Uh, and, Mr Speaker, as I said, we have worked through a record number of cases and returned a record number of people back to where they've come. All of that is a plan that is working, and we can see that it's working, because the numbers of people coming to this country are down by over a third, Mr Speaker. But again, it is a bit rich to hear him in here pretending that he cares about how we actually stop the boats when he's been crystal clear. He's been crystal clear and said that even if the plan is working to reduce the numbers, he would still scrap it, Mr Speaker. It's because he has no values, no conviction and no plan, and it's back to square one. Uh, No, 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 no. He hasn't got a clue where they are, has he? I, I I can tell you one place they are, and that's Rwanda. (laughs) <laughs> because the only people who sent to Rwanda is cabinet ministers. And, 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 and for all the word, the ridiculous thing is, we know the Prime Minister himself doesn't even believe in this Rwanda gimmick. He had to be talked out of scrapping the whole thing. He didn't want to fund it. He didn't think it would work. When he sees his party tearing itself apart, hundreds of bald men scrapping over a single broken comb. (laughs) Doesn't he wish he'd had the courage to stick to his guns? Well, Mr Mr. Speaker, now, I have absolute conviction that the plan we've put in place will work. Absolute conviction, because I believe it's important that we grip this problem. Now, he spends a lot of his time in this house talking about his time as a lawyer, Mr Speaker, and I would urge him to listen to them. Because Lord Wolfson has said that our bill severely limits the... Four eminent KCs have said that it is undoubtedly the most robust piece of immigration legislation this Parliament has seen. And, and Mr Speaker, a former Supreme Court... I want to hear what the Prime Minister's got to say. (laughs) Because it matters to my constituents, those who feel it doesn't matter to those. Please leave, Prime Minister. As I said, Mr Speaker... Four eminent cases said this is undoubtedly the most robust legislation passed, and a former Supreme Court justice has been clear that the bill would work. But I know, Mr Speaker, he's always been more interested in what lefty lawyers have to say, Mr Speaker. 
I've even got here, I've even got here the textbook that he authored for them. And it's called, and I quote, European Human Rights Law by Keir Starmer. So, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, when I stand up, please sit down. Can I just say, we don't use props in this house. And I will certainly ensure that if you do need reminding, I certainly will. Keir Starmer. It's such utterly pathetic nonsense. <laughs> he, he's been brutally exposed by his own MPs yet again. He's got one party chair who says she hopes the Lords will rip his Rwanda deal to pieces. He's got two more who had to quit because they don't think it'll work. All of them appointed by him, all now in open revolt against his policy, each other uh, and, and reality. <laughs> is, is there any wonder they all think this gimmick is doomed to failure when the Prime Minister himself doesn't believe in it? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it is rich to hear from the Honourable Gentleman about belief in something because and it will be news to him. It is actually the case that you can believe in something and stick to that position yeah. on this side of the house. I will say to this side, oh, hello, somebody's jumping in from over. Can I just say it's very important. It's an important day. People want to know what's going on. So I want my constituents, just like yours, to hear what the Prime Minister's got to say. Prime Minister. Just this week, Mr Speaker, we had another example of the Honourable Gentleman doing one thing, saying another, because it, 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 this, this week he backed the Home Secretary in banning the terrorist group Hezbut Tahrir, despite him personally using the European Court of Human Rights to try and stop them being banned. And don't take my word for it, Mr Speaker, the extremist's own press release said, and I quote, the Hezbut Tahrir legal team led by Keir Starmer. Now, I know, I know he doesn't like talking about them because they've been a client, but when I see a group chanting jihad on our streets, I ban them. He invoices them. Because there's eight questions that I think some of the, you may want. Well, I'll tell you what, there's some's already gone off the list who wanted them. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, if he stuck to his position, he'd be voting with us. He'd be voting with us. His former Home Secretary says the plan won't work. His current Home Secretary calls it batshit. His former Immigration Minister doesn't back his plan. Even the Prime Minister himself doesn't believe in it. And last week, another of his MPs said the Tories should admit that things have got worse since they came to office, yeah. that after 14 years they've left Britain less united, yeah. the country is a sadder place. Yeah. If the Prime Minister can't even persuade his own MPs that it's worth supporting him, if he himself doesn't even believe in his own policies, why on earth should anyone else think differently? Yeah. Mr Speaker, another week when it's crystal clear the Honourable Gentleman doesn't believe in anything and he doesn't have a plan. Now, while he talks the country down, let me update him on what's actually been happening in the past week. Inflation more than halved from 11% to 4%. Real wages rising. Real wages rising for the fifth month in a row. Last week, rates started falling and millions of people benefited from a tax cut worth £450. So while he takes us back to square one with a £28 billion tax grab, let's stick with a plan that's delivering a brighter future for Britain. Mr Speaker, it's against the law to silence <coughs> victims of crime, but that's exactly what the Post Office did through the yeah. use of non-disclosure agreements. And this is just the most recent case of NDAs covering up mismanagement, misconduct and even crimes at work. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, consider banning their use in all severance agreements once and for all? Minister. My right honourable friend is right to raise an important point. And the ability to speak out about things is key 
to unlocking justice. And while NDAs can have a place, uh, my honourable friend is right to say that they shouldn't be used to stop victims of crime, in particular getting the justice that they deserve. Uh, I can tell her that the Ministry of Justice are carefully considering how to best address this issue, including legislation, and I know that my right honourable friend, the Justice Secretary, will keep the House updated on further progress. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when people woke up today in homes that they can't afford to heat with mortgages that they are struggling to pay to news that inflation is once again on the rise, they will have looked to Westminster for answers. And instead, they find a UK government which is tearing itself apart over how quickly it can send vulnerable people on a plane to Rwanda. Surely the Prime Minister must understand that the anger that some of his own backbenchers have towards him is no comparison to the anger that the public have towards his party. Prime Minister. M Mr Speaker, if the Honourable Gentleman did care about supporting working families to pay their bills, to pay their mortgage, why on earth is the SNP making Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom, where the average, Mr Speaker, not the wealthiest, where the average worker in Scotland is now paying more tax than they do in England? Stephen Flynn. Of course, Mr Speaker, when it comes to the, Rio the Rwanda bill, the reality is that if you want to stop the smuggling gangs, you should introduce safe and legal routes. But instead, the Prime Minister is seeking to weaponise some of the most vulnerable people in society. It is straight out of the cruel and callous right-wing extremist playgroup. His time in office is fast approaching its conclusion. Does he seriously want this to be his legacy? Prime Minister. Well, M Mr Speaker, as I said, it is important that we stop the boats because illegal migration is simply not fair, Mr Speaker. Yeah. It's not right that some people jump the queue, that they take away our resources to help those who are the most compassionate, that need our most help, and, by the way, Mr Speaker, are exploited by gangs, and many of them lose their lives making these dangerous crossings. So I completely disagree with the Honourable Gentleman. The fair and the compassionate thing to do is to break these criminal gangs, and that's why we're going to stop the boats. Russell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Unexpectedly, five months ago, I had a heart attack. Thanks to the swift action of the NHS emergency services, it was caught early. So one stent operation later, I was on a swift path to rehabilitation and recovery and yeah. sat here today uh, fighting fit and a bit lighter too. Um, <laughs> so along with encouraging everyone to visit the British Heart Foundation website to understand the early warning signs and get fantastic resources uh, to help them, would the Prime Minister also join me in personally thanking everyone who helped save my life and help me recover, including the East of England Ambulance Service, the teams at Watford General and Harefield Hospital, the cardiac rehabilitation teams, and everyone who supported me, especially my family and my team, some of whom are in the gallery today, who helped ensure that I continue to deliver for the great people of Watford. I thank my honourable friend for sharing his story, and I know the whole house will be delighted to hear that he's made a swift recovery. We all wish him good health for the future as he resumes his excellent campaigning on behalf of his constituents in Watford. And I also join him in thanking our fantastic NHS staff for the life-saving work that they do up and down the country. We're backing them with record resources, from our doctors to our ambulance service. We are all in this house truly grateful for what they do. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Until the UK government calls for an immediate ceasefire, it is complicit in the horrors yeah, in Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Not my words, yeah, but yeah. those of the head of Oxfam, Absolutely. who, like every single agency trying to operate on the ground, is clear that aid can't be effectively delivered while fighting continues. More UK aid is, of course, welcome, but even when it does get through, it can result in what one Palestinian aid worker calls bombing us on full stomachs. Yep. 24 thousand people have already been killed. So can he tell us what will it take for him to back a permanent bilateral ceasefire? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, of course we want to see a peaceful resolution to this conflict as soon as possible. A sustainable permanent ceasefire with an end to the destruction, fighting and loss of life, release of hostages 
and no resumption of hostilities would, of course, be the best way forward. But in order to achieve that, a number of things need to happen. Hamas would have to agree to release the, all the hostages. Hamas would no longer have to be in charge of Gaza, and the threat of more rocket attacks from Hamas into Israel would have to end. And the Palestinian Authority, boosted with assistance, would need to return to Gaza in order to provide governance and aid. That is a sustainable ceasefire that we will work very hard to bring about. Nick Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I was unsure whether to raise a national issue, such as the desperate need for a Minister for Men, or a local issue, such as Doncaster's need for a new hospital or Edlington for a new leisure centre. But I thought the best thing I could do is ask the Prime Minister to come and have a tour of Doncaster. Yeah. And while I'm showing him around my hometown, I can press the need for a Minister for Men, I can show him the site for a new hospital, and I can introduce him to the people of Edlington so he can discuss their new leisure centre. So will the Prime Minister accept my invitation? Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to my honourable friend's fantastic campaigning on behalf of his constituents. Doncaster City Council has received, I think, more than £80 million in levelling up funding to support its regeneration products. And most recently, Doncaster has been awarded £20 million in our long-term plan for towns over the next 10 years, which I know he is working very hard to make sure is prioritised uh, for local people. I would be delighted to discuss those projects and his other ideas when I come and visit him as soon as my diary allows. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 71% of requests for funding from the Community Ownership Fund aimed at saving libraries, pubs and village halls have been rejected since 2021. Yeah. It pits communities against each other yeah. and does nothing to address the underlying causes that have led to the loss of these much-loved assets. Yeah. When will the Government offer more than a simple sticking plaza throughout towns, high streets and communities? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Oh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I, actually I set up the Community Ownership Fund when I was Chancellor and it is doing fantastic work, funding hundreds of projects projects across the country, including, I believe, one in the Honourable Lady's own constituency, uh, the Back on the Map scheme. Uh, it is there to support local communities to take over assets, whether it's pubs, uh, village halls or other community assets, and it's doing a fantastic job. It's right that there's a competitive process, because we want to make sure that that money is deployed in the areas where it can make the most difference. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Overcrowding on Chiltern Railways has become a daily misery for commuters from stations like Haddenham and Tame Parkway and Prince's Risborough in my constituency, the root cause of which is an ageing fleet constantly breaking down and shorter trains having to be run. There are proposals on the table for both short-term additional capacity and long-term fleet renewals. So will my right friend, the Prime Minister, instruct the Department of Transport to fast-track those proposals so we can end overcrowding on Chilton? Prime Minister. And I agree with my honourable friend that the performance on Chilton hasn't been good enough in recent times. Uh, I know that Chilton have recently begun engagement with the rolling stock leasing market, which will help reduce overcrowding, uh, but also together with DFT, they're looking at providing additional capacity at peak times. So I know my honourable friend, the Rail Minister, will ensure that these plans continue to progress and keep my honourable friend updated. Patrick Reddy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr yeah, yeah. Speaker. What exactly is it about the prospect of deportation to Rwanda that makes the government think it will be such a deterrent? to asylum seekers. Does it think that life in Rwanda is somehow less comfortable, less secure, less safe than it is here in the United Kingdom? What does the government think is wrong with Rwanda that means asylum seekers won't want to live there? It's nothing that there's anything wrong with it. It's just that it's not the United Kingdom, Mr Speaker. And I have to point out to the honourable gentleman that deterrence works. We know that it works because our scheme with Albania has ensured a 90% reduction in arrivals from that country. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I know my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is committed to energy security and the development of renewables, as am I, and that's why Sizewell C started the DCO this week. However, there are plenty of other developments which are happening on greenfield sites where CPOs are planned to be used by National Grid to plough up farming fields used for food but also tree production as well. When there are brownfield sites already available connected to the network, National Grid is refusing to publish its study of Bradwell and why they deem it would not be suitable for this connection of offshore wind farms and interconnectors. Will he meet with me to discuss this and other East Anglian MPs and also to use the powers of his office to get that study published? Yeah. 
As my honourable friend will know, that planning applications for new infrastructure are managed independently, so I can't comment on specific creatives. But I do agree with her that it's important to listen to the views of local communities like those that she represents across Suffolk and East Anglia. I know my honourable friend for Aberdeenshire West was visiting her area recently to mark the commencement of the project at Sizewell C, and I can assure her that relevant ministers will continue to pay close attention to her concerns. Stevens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the House last week correctly described the contaminated blood scandal as on an another level compared to other scandals. Now that Sir Brian Langstaff has announced today the publication of the final report of the infected blood inquiry, he reminds us, Mr Speaker, that his principal recommendation remains that a compensation scheme should be set up with urgency and that no one should be in any doubt about the serious nature of the failings over more than six decades that led to catastrophic loss of life and compounded suffering. Prime Minister, over 100 parliamentarians wrote to you this week, so can you tell us now when those affected will be paid compensation for their loss? Mr Seeker, I am acutely aware of the strength of feeling on this issue and indeed the suffering of all of those impacted by this dreadful scandal. I gave evidence to the inquiry last year and, as I said then, I recognise the suffering that thousands have experienced over decades. Uh, he will know that the Minister for the Cabinet Office updated Parliament on this towards the end of last year. He'll know it's a highly complex issue. Interim payments have been made in some cases, and we are committed, absolutely committed, to responding to the final report as quickly as possible following its publication. Robert Neil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, Conservative-controlled Bromley Council's children's services were rated outstanding by Ofsted. Yeah, 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 yeah. In all four areas of inspection, only the third time that has happened under the current framework. Will he join me in congratulating the officers and members of Bromley Council and perhaps even visit Bromley and see our new cost-saving civic centre? Yeah. Well, uh, perhaps not, not quite uh, on my way to Doncaster, but I'll bear it in, uh, I'll bear it in mind. But can I join my honourable friend in paying tribute to Bromley Council and all the officers involved in providing what is an incredibly important service in their local community and looking after some of the most vulnerable children in our society. They all deserve our thanks and our praise for their brilliant efforts. Yeah, yeah. Dr Rupert. Thank you, Mr Speaker. HS2 promised to transform intercity travel and my seat where Old Oak Common will be one day. But after Leeds and Manchester were ditched, it's London ends now in doubt. Could the PM today commit to ensuring it at least reaches Euston, or is he intent on stopping all transport forms, except private jets, maybe? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Prime Minister. Well, I think, I think her, her leader might have something to say about the forms of transportation, Mr Speaker, and perhaps on HS2 as well, because I still haven't actually heard from him his position on the whole subject. But we have, uh, Mr Speaker, I would say Old Oak Common is destined to be one of the foremost stations in the country because of the station and the extra connectivity that it will have across London as the initial terminus for HS2 trains. And as we said at the announcement, we are working with the private sector, as we have done in other developments in London, to raise private money, save the taxpayer money, and deliver the connection to Euston as planned. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've just got back from the inaugural Women's Health Summit. During the summit, it was announced that the specialist maternal mental health services will now be available to women in every part of England by March. This is particularly pertinent for me after one of my constituents, Jessica Cronshaw, passed away whilst pregnant with her baby Elsie after suffering with severe pregnancy sickness, hypermesis gravidarum. So can I thank the government for following through with this important reform and push him to keep going with the spirit of this reform so our, our NHS is fit for women in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I uh, thank my honourable friend for raising this matter, and I know the whole House will want to convey our sympathies to Jessica's family, uh, but I'm pleased that the reforms that we are making will make a difference to women across the country in the future. We're committed to our women's health strategy, and I'm grateful that, that for her support and, again, her ad advice and ideas so we can ensure it delivers the care that we want it to across the country. Andrew Gwynn. The Conservative candidate for the Wellingborough by-election yesterday revealed that the Conservative Party had offered her a deal to be the candidate if the previous member, her partner, stood down without a fuss. The Prime Minister said just last week that candidate selection 
is all done locally within his party. Yeah. So would he now like to deny that this secret deal was offered? Yeah. As, as, Mr. Figure, as I said last week, in our party, candidate selection is done locally. Yeah. Yeah. James Gray. Uh, Mr. Speaker, would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree with me that a remote rural hotel is just the wrong place to house asylum seekers and refugees from their, from their point of view? And would you therefore join me in thanking the Home Secretary for announcing yesterday that the Wiltshire Hotel outside Rolwyn Bassett is in fact to be returned to its proper purpose uh, in April? Well, th I thank my uh, honourable friend for the question. He's absolutely right. The use of hotels is unfair and also it's unfair on local communities and also costs taxpayers eight million pounds a day. And that's why our plans to reduce the number of people coming has meant that we could close the first 50 hotels across the country with more to follow. And I thank the Home Secretary and his team for their efforts. But fundamentally, the only way to resolve this once and for all is to implement our Rwanda scheme so we can have a working deterrent. And that's how we will stop the boats. Charlotte Nettles. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have been contacted by desperate constituents who have rung every single pharmacy within a 50-mile radius of Warrington and still haven't been able to access their medication for ADHD. This has been going on for months and isn't just a Warrington issue. Pharmacists are calling it the worst shortage ever seen, with only 11% of people able to access their full dose this month, and ADHD UK have called the government's response pathetic. They're right, aren't they? Yeah. So I'm very sorry to hear about the situation in the Honourable Lady's constituency, but the Health Secretary obviously heard what she said and is in touch with the relevant drug bodies to make sure we can have the provision of ADHD medicine to all of those who need it. Tom Hunt. For around a decade, over 200 of my constituents in the mill uh, complex in Ipswich have been in a, caught in the cruelest form of limbo. Um, there's deep structural problems with the building and cladding problems. A few years ago, they got about £50 million out of court settlement to make a contribution towards the cladding cost. The freeholder, NAMA, the Irish financial entity set up after the Irish banking crisis, ran away with that money, putting my residents and my constituents back in square one with little to no hope. Will the Prime Minister talk to the Irish tea shop to raise this immoral case and also meet with me? to discuss a way forward for my constituents, who I meet with every week. Prime Minister. Oh, well, I'm very sorry to hear about my honourable friend's uh, case, but I'll ensure that the government looks into the details and gets back to him in shortest order about how we can support him and his constituents. Martin, Dr Tewes, question. Number 10, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I have repeatedly expressed my commitment to joint working with the First Minister of Scotland to deliver for the people across the country. I am grateful for that um, answer, Mr Speaker. While there has rightly been much attention paid to the Post Office Horizon scandal, there is another shocking example of government and private sector collusion that began under the last Labour administration and continued under the Tories. Mr Speaker, almost 200,000 mortgage prisoners who borrowed with high street lenders such as Northern Rock have become trapped after the portfolio was sold off to foreign entities like Topaz Finance and Heliodor, who have been creaming off extortionate revisionary standard variable rates essentially since 2008, leaving even those who kept up with payments in danger of having their home repossessed. 200,000 aspirant homeowners have had their dream taken away from. So can the Prime Minister, instead of playing catch-up with like he is doing with the post office scandal, meet with me and campaigners to discuss what more can be done for mortgage prisoners? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am familiar uh, with the situation for mortgage prisoners and something I worked on as Chancellor. And I know the Treasury and the current Chancellor have been engaging with campaign groups and others to find ways to resolve it. It's not an easy situation to fix overnight, but there are things that are being looked at as we speak. Douglas Ross. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Scotch Whisky Association published a report looking at the economic impact of the sector, not just in Scotland but across the whole of the UK. Some of the highlights included that in 2022 they contribute generated £7.1 billion in gross value added, £2.1 billion has been invested in capital projects between 2018 and 2022, and 41,000 jobs are supported by the sector in Scotland, including one in nine in my Murray constituency. Does the Prime Minister agree 
agree that supporting the Scotch whisky industry in the forthcoming spring budget and beyond is a correct priority for this government. <coughs> well, my honourable friend is a superb ambassador for Murray and for Scotch whisky, and he's right, it's a hugely successful export industry that supports tens of thousands of skilled jobs across Scotland. I won't obviously tread on the Chancellor's toes about future budgets, but I am proud of this government's track record in supporting the industry. Having removed US tariffs on Scotch whisky, reduced tariffs and deals with countries like Morocco and Argentina, and also supporting the sector's interests in our FTAs with Australia, New Zealand, and most recently with CPTPP. Peter Dowd. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has been very keen to take credit for falling inflation in previous months. Will he now take responsibility for today's rise? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, inflation was over 11 per cent when I got this job. Inflation today is 4 per cent, Mr Speaker. In common with the US, France, Germany, all countries have seen a mild tick up in December. All countries have. But the crucial thing is that inflation has been more than halved, yeah. delivered ahead of schedule, and that is having an enormous benefit to families up and down the country, benefit that would be reversed by his party's plan to saddle them with £28 billion of tax rises. Mr Speaker, I'm a keen park runner in Warsaw, but I'm also part of the core team of volunteers that recently brought Parkrun to Tamworth. Oh. So in the 20th anniversary year of Parkrun, will the Prime Minister join me in encouraging other towns that don't yet have a Parkrun to get one? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, it's great uh, to hear that my honourable friend is an avid Parkrunner, and thank, I thank him for actually volunteering so that the people of Tamworth can enjoy one too. I completely agree with him. Uh, when I had more time, I was a regular at the North Allerton Park Run and the Junior Park Run as well, which I recommend for those with children. It is a fantastic and accessible way to get people moving, and I join him in encouraging everyone to get involved in his local area and beyond. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At the last general election, residents... Question. At the last general election, residents in West Hertfordshire were promised a new hospital, but we are still waiting for the green light and having to put up with broken lifts and overly crowded treatment wards. In other parts of the country, there are entire hospital buildings that have had to be closed down, like the one in Stepping Hill in Stockport, because they are structurally unsafe. From broken promises on new hospitals to the backlog of repairs, people are sick and tired of waiting. So can the Prime Minister tell me by the time of the next general election, how many of the broken hospitals will be fixed and will my residents be able to point to a single spade in the ground? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we're investing record sums to not just deliver 40 new hospitals across the country, but 90 different hospital upgrades. And she'll be familiar with the plans, I hope, at West Hertfordshire Trust to develop a new emergency and specialty care facility at Watford General, including women's and children's services. It will make an enormous difference to residents in the area. Believe it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A recent BBC News article raised fears that Blythe could become a ghost town as we see our shopping centre closed to be replaced by a new higher education facility. Residents are right to be concerned, and I have personally seen decades of labour neglect and decline in our town. And I have, I really have. But this Conservative government has invested hundreds of millions of pounds to level up my constituency with spades in the ground as I speak here in the House of Commons. Can my right honourable friend assure me that the rebirth of our towns will continue as a key focus of this Conservative government? Well, my uh, honourable friend is absolutely right, and I commend him for being such a strong advocate for Blythe. And I, he, nearly half of the recent Towns Fund has been distributed to northern regions in England to level up constituencies like his own. And that is the difference. As he said, after years, if not decades, of neglect under the party opposite, it's this government that is levelling up across our country. Final question, Ian Mans. Yeah. I'm very grateful, Mr Speaker. In June 2022, to some fanfare, the government announced the approval of £41 million for a package of works for the restoration of the Tyne Bridge. 
which is the root of the A167, the old A1, and it connects Gateshead with Newcastle city centre, and is instantly recognisable around the world as an emblem of Tyneside. However, the funding is still awaiting sign-off within the Department of Transport and work cannot progress. So given the scale and the complexity of the work that's required, and the significant additional cost implications of funding doesn't come forward. Can we actually have the money, please, to get on with the work so that the bridge will be ready for its centenary celebrations in 2028? Well, Mr Speaker, I'll in ensure that the relevant minister gets back to him with an update on the project. And I'm pleased not just investing in that project in his area, but also following on from the last question, I know his area has received levelling up funding worth £20 million to help transform the visitor economy in Gateshead, yet more example of this government investing to level up across the north and across the country. Yeah. That completes Prime Minister's questions. Thank you.